Here's my quick review for AP Physics 1. I'm going to try to keep it to 10 minutes here. So first off, kinematics. You can only apply the kinematic equations if the acceleration is constant. The acceleration is changing at all, or it varies as a function of time, then you cannot apply the kinematic equations. Okay, and then when you do projectile motion problems, which is probably the more important of the kinematic stuff you need to be able to do, horizontal acceleration is zero, vertical acceleration is downward with G, and you want to set up those kinematic variables, assign them, and then use the kinematic equations to solve for whatever you are um, looking for in a particular problem. Okay, forces. Make sure you know how to draw a free body diagram, then apply net force equals MA. There's always a process I teach my students about how to solve problems with forces. One, draw a free body diagram. Two, decompose the vectors into the horizontal and vertical components. Three, applies net force equals MA in the vertical or horizontal direction. Okay, circular motion. There are no new forces when you draw your free body diagrams in circular motion, okay? This is the most important thing I tell you. Some people think that there's new forces to include. There are no new forces when you draw the free body diagram for circular motion. Circular mo or centripetal acceleration, which is a new kind of acceleration we talk about in circular motion, is when an object curves or changes direction. The velocity vector doesn't stay in the same, same axes. It sort of turns one way or the other. That's due to a centripetal acceleration. Now that centripetal acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circle, but the free body diagram is the exact same. Okay, so you don't do anything different about the free body diagram. Just note that there is now a component of the acceleration that is perpendicular to the velocity and it's toward the center of the circle of the curved path. Okay. Now some people could view centripetal force. Again, centripetal force is not a new force you draw. Centripetal force is just what we call the net force towards the center of the circle. It is the force that is responsible that you set equal to m times centripetal acceleration. So you're still applying net force equals ma. It's just the a, in the case of circular motion, is v squared over r, or the centripetal acceleration. Gravitation. Gravitation is usually pretty easy. What we do is gravity is mg. When you're far from, that's near the surface of the Earth. When you are far from the surface of the Earth, and you have to be pretty far, you're talking about a few hundred miles to uh, make it a difference. When you're far from the surface of the Earth, we actually use a more accurate Newton's law of gravitation. And then also, this is the form of acceleration due to gravity. Sometimes people don't know this. Gravitational field or acceleration due to gravity is equal to g times the mass of the planetary body over the r squared. It's basically night like Newton's law of gravity, except you're pulling out the mass of the object. Okay, that is how you calculate uh, 9.8. Now, a lot of times the r is the radius of the planet if you're near the surface of the Earth, because the distance r in those equations is the distance to the center of mass of the two objects. Okay, work and energy. Work is a scalar, so we start with work. Work is a scalar. It is equal to the force parallel times to the displacement. So make sure you understand how to calculate work. If works in if the if the force that is applying in the displacement is the same direction, work is positive. If they're opposite directions, work is negative. And the big thing about work is work causes a change in energy of the system. Work equals the change in energy. Okay? And when you're talking about energy, systems are really a key way we talk about uh, energy. If a system can an object by itself can contain kinetic energy, okay, translational kinetic energy. But if the system contains the Earth or a planetary body, then you include gravitational potential energy. If the system contains the spring, you include spring potential energy. And any objects that are moving in a straight line have kinetic energy, or any objects that are spinning around a particular axis have rotational kinetic energy. Rotation, that's how you distinguish between translational kinetic and rotational kinetic, is if the axis of rotation is moving in a straight line, then it has translational kinetic, like a bicycle wheel that's moving in a straight line. It's spinning around an axis, and it's moving in a straight line, so it has both forms of energy. And then last, we apply conservation of energy if there's no work on the system. If there's no work, there's no change in energy, and thus the energy is conserved during that scenario. Okay, Linear momentum. Make sure you remember, momentum is a vector. It's equal to m times v, and it matters the direction of the velocity. 
because momentum is a vector. Unlike work and energy, which are scalar values, momentum is a vector value. So the direction is really important when you're doing this. The key thing is impulse causes a change in momentum. All right, so impulse, I didn't write the equation. That's F delta T equals M or, you know, change in momentum. Okay, impulse is the left line. The right side is the change in momentum. When you have collisions, we often do conservation of momentum. As long as you include both objects in the system, then the internal forces of their collision do not um, affect the overall momentum of the system because there's no external forces. However, collisions, you can lose energy due to deformation. Those are called we call inelastic collisions where the kinetic energy is not conserved. Or in the case of elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. When they ask you to justify whether or not a collision is elastic or inelastic, you need to relate it to the kinetic energy being conserved or not conserved. Finally, the big one, rotation, which I think is kind of two units. Okay, um, Kinemax is a rotational version of all the variables. And then what we do is there's a couple, few other equations that relate the linear motion variables to the angular motion variables. And that's where you just multiply the angular motion variables by r to get the linear motion. So distance is r times the change in angular position. Uh, linear velocity is equal to r times angular velocity. And linear acceleration is r times angular acceleration. For torque, torque causes angular acceleration. Just like in Newton's second law of motion, force causes a linear acceleration or a circular acceleration, torque causes an angular acceleration. Torque requires that a force be perpendicular to the R vector, all right? And the R vector is from the axis of rotation to where the force is applied when we do that, okay? So if you wanna, if I wanna move my elbow and rotate it like this, I have to apply a force that would cause it to rotate. It must be perpendicular to the R vector here, okay? Rotational inertia is how difficult it is to rotate something. So that's where the I is in the net torque equals I alpha equation. The more rotational inertia, the harder it is to rotate. When are things harder to rotate? When they have more mass, or the mass is distributed further away from the axis of rotation, okay? There's also rotational kinetic energy, which we touched on. That's if an object is spinning around in axes. The different pieces of mass are moving at different speeds, but rotational kinetic energy, we can use the one half I omega squared in that scenario. Rolling without slipping, whenever you hear rolling without slipping, what that means is there's no kinetic friction between the object and the surface. Okay, so when it rolls, it rolls nice and smoothly and it doesn't rub like that. So there's no kinetic friction. And so there's no loss in energy from that friction. Okay, there, and then it may have a torque from static friction on them. There may be static friction if there is angular acceleration happening. So if it's moving at a constant speed, no angular acceleration as it's rolling, there's no torque necessary. If it's rolling down a hill or up a hill, there is an angular acceleration because the angular velocity is changing and thus there may be a torque from static friction. And then finally, there's angular momentum. And just like linear momentum, you need, an, you need an angular impulse to cause a change in angular momentum. And no angular impulse means that we apply conservation of angular momentum. Now note that sometimes it's collisions, right? Like just like in linear momentum, but sometimes um, they can just be interacting in a way where the I, the rotational inertia is changing of a system, but um, there's no external torque, so we do conservation of angular momentum. And examples of that are like divers who are spinning, they tuck their body in really tight to reduce their rotational inertia, so they spin faster by conservation of angular momentum. And last, simple harmonic motion. Okay, there's a force restoring towards the equilibrium point. That's what characterizes a simple harmonic motion. What that results in is that the, the motion is, is periodic and sinusoid. So as a sine and cosine form for the um, for them, uh, the pendulum and the mass spring are two types of harmonic motion we study. And there's always an exchange of potential energy to kinetic energy. In the case of a pendulum, it's a gravitational potential energy converting to kinetic energy back to gravitational potential energy. For a mass on a spring, it's spring potential energy and kinetic energy if it's a horizontal mass on a spring. And if it's a vertical mass on a spring, then you have the which is the most complicated kind you have three forms of energy, gravitational potential, kinetic, and spring potential energy, all. But again, equilibrium is when the net force is zero in there. Now, if you guys wanna see more of these kind of summary notes, um, I'm gonna have a link to it in the description below. 
that you can check out. It has a little bit more comprehensive set of these notes. But these are the main ideas from each of the major units. And uh, I hope it finds it, I hope you find it helpful for your last minute AP exam review.